Kayvon Kalatbari from Denver Relief, Denver Relief Consulting. Among other things, you might remember Ian Sieb. This is Ian's partner. Uh, but he's, of course, much more than that. So uh, he takes us through everything that he has done, uh, and most of the things that he's working on now, and it's an enjoyable conversation. Khaled Bari. Kayvon Khaled Bari. Khaled Bari. Yeah. yeah. Ch- Khaled Bari, if you want to. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it from? Uh, my father's Iranian, yeah. mother's German, English, and Cherokee Indian. So my right. full name is Kayvon Sarnath Tyler Khalabedi Lamaki. And you're uh, pointing out uh, tattoos. Those are permanent tattoos. Uh, they are, yeah. yeah. Unlike my uh, my niece's uh, temporary tattoos. She's four and a half. These are... So those are your name, And then there's also like some imagery there as well. Yeah, this is on the... I've always been kind of distant from my heritage in Iran, so I've uh, got the... Well, this was on the Iranian flag prior to the revolution in 79. Yeah. Uh, this is on the Iranian flag now. Uh-huh. Uh huh. That's my name and my first name in Farsi, and then uh, this is my mother's maiden name, Ramel. That's the uh, the English end of it. Okay. So you take things seriously. That all means something to me. Each, this is an old Ben Franklin cartoon. So each uh, it was the first cartoon ever published in the United States, actually, in a yeah. paper, and it said "Join or Die" underneath it, and each one represented a colony. I got right. a very small family, so I did it with each one of my family members. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty deep, man. Yeah, yeah. I think we already started, so I had already pressed record. So let's just keep going, I guess, right? So Kayvon, you're one of those names, man. You know, I'm sitting. You know, the chicken suits in the other uh, office down down. Uh, we're in uh, Denver Relief Consulting headquarters. Denver Relief is right downstairs. Yep. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. We already spoke to Ian, as you know, and uh, let's just dive right in. You uh, you said when I walked in that the First couple of people you met are people that we've had on, which are Steve Fox and, and Mason DeVert. Is it, uh, were you being hyperbolic or? <laughs> no, I, so I moved to uh, moved to Denver from Lincoln, Nebraska, about ten and a half years ago. Yeah, and I didn't didn't know anybody. I, I was working for an engineering firm at the time, so they transferred me out to help start this office. Yeah, and just was looking to make friends. Um, didn't didn't know anyone. Uh, so my brother and I, who he moved out here shortly after I did to live with me and just kind of start this new life for ourselves. Yeah. And uh, we got online to start looking at places we could volunteer, uh, ways we can be, uh, you know, meet people through giving. And ended up finding, uh, my, my brother did, Hassan, um, up in Boulder and Fort Collins, this group called SAFER, SAFER Alternative for Enjoyable Recreation, mm-hmm. uh, which had just passed initiatives on CU and CSU campuses to equalize possession of cannabis mm-hmm. on campus uh, with alcohol. And even though cannabis was illegal, they were both illegal on campus. And mm-hmm. understanding that, um, especially like CU has issues with domestic violence, with uh, you know the rape culture, with fraternities and, and what not uh, that if, if people choose to use cannabis which is safer and doesn't come along with those uh, ills why not um, mm-hmm. so they passed it they had that success and then wanted to move that down to Denver um, that was the I-100 initiative mm-hmm. um, so when I uh, when we reached out to them initially they were looking for volunteers to help collect signatures and to help fundraise and uh, protest and hold signs and do all of this so uh, we went down uh, to where uh, Mason and Evan Ackerfeld, mm-hmm. uh, who was the assistant director at the time, uh, were living uh, down in southeast Denver mm-hmm. and uh, went to go chat with them about it. And that, that was the first time I met Mason. Um, I ended up starting Sexy Pizza with Evan Ackerfeld, uh, the gentleman who helped uh, Mason and Steve start Safer. There you go. Um, so it's been born in that since the beginning. But met, met Steve shortly after that just because he was really the kind of the head of the operations on the MPP side. Mm-hmm. And uh, just really got to know those guys they were the the first people that you know i really got to know well in denver and hang out with and just so happened to be that they were really the the birther the birthers the creators of the cannabis movement here in colorado absolutely absolutely and uh so we, we talked about iran those are your roots where are you from though you moved from yeah, where from lincoln nebraska so yeah so you are from nebraska yeah yeah this... I lived there uh, all my life my yeah. par- parents got divorced when i was 10 i had a a mother that was a, a very, very strong worker gave me all the work ethic that I, that I have the, today. You know, mm-hmm. taught me what it was to be a good person. She was a great mom, even though she worked two jobs. How many brothers and sisters? I got one younger brother. Right. Um, so that's the guy that came with you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hassan. 
Um, my mom ended up getting remarried when I was 15. Okay. And I ended up graduating high school when I was 16 because of that, because she moved to Montana and I didn't didn't want to finish high school there. So I graduated high school a year early and started living on my own when I was 16 back in Nebraska. In Nebraska, you're living alone. Uh, well, I was living with a gentleman I worked with who was 21 at the time, so okay. he was able to buy me alcohol. Oh, well. um, but no, I yeah, I've been living on my own since I was 16. Uh, wow, I've, I've always been kind of an entrepreneur. I sold uh, you know fake Rolexes and tag Hewer and Oakley things on eBay before that was really frowned upon. Before it was frowned upon, <laughs> I got a cease and desist letter from Rolex when I was 15 years old. That's it's impressive. Let's just say that they know who you are, right? You know, but I uh, I definitely hustled. I I, I had a history. Of of uh, acknowledging and now I'm dealing with the repercussions of said acknowledgement in Illinois with some of these lawsuits that are going on mm -hmm. but the, I, I've dealt cannabis since I was about 15 years old sure I did that in high school held down a full-time job graduated graduated high school with a 3.97 GPA early um, how did you expedite that and I wouldn't even know what to do if I was a junior in high school would you go into the principal's office literally how do you graduate early from high school it was about a, a week prior I yeah. had found out that my mom was getting married and I kind of you know, hit this wall with what am I going to do? Huh. Um, went into uh, my counselor's office and just kind of asked what we could do. I ended up taking eight summer school classes after my junior year, uh, three of them online, five of them at a summer school okay. and uh, graduated early. Never had a graduation ceremony uh, with the class that I graduated with. Never had the you know, the prom or any of that, the stuff that went along with being a senior in high school. Nor did you look back, Kayvon. Nor did I care. I really didn't care for school all that much. Yeah, I, I could see it in your face <laughs> that the greater point was, I don't really care. I'm out. I'm done. I got what I wanted to get yeah. out of it. You know, it, it was, I think it was great for some foundational understandings of things I was going to deal with in life. But mm -hmm. for the most part, it was what most people don't like about school. I was kind of the outcast. I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I... I was kind of a nerd. I we didn't have a whole lot of money, so I dressed a little awkward, mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to get the hell out of there. I saw other people that were doing things that um, weren't by the book, so to say, and I, I really appreciate that lifestyle. I think more than what most people do in Nebraska, which is get get your insurance job, get married by the time you're 20, have your mm -hmm. kid by the time that you're 21, and settle down. And that's it. That's uh, not at all appealing to me. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and we'll we'll touch on kids in, in in a little bit. But as far as your mother moving to Montana is she still there yeah she has a bakery up there she's actually doing something with Nat Geo right now she um, has this bakery that in a town of 50 some people has about 100 to 150 people that have breakfast at it every morning mm. um, they're at Cook City Montana which is the northeast entrance of Yellowstone okay uh, so they got a lot of tourists they own a hotel uh, used to own a snowmobile dealership with her husband yeah. now they own a repair shop but uh, she's got a wonderful life up there but she splits time between there and Fremont Nebraska where we have a cabin on a lake that I kind of grew up on when I was little and that just sounds serene is it as beautiful as it sounds uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty beautiful. It's, it was an old sand pit and man-made lake that, uh, my, my grandpa used to work at Goodyear okay. uh, back in Nebraska. So this was like a bunch of Goodyear employees got together and bought this land and made a lake. And, and I think there's like I don't know, 50 or 60 cabins on it now, but it so was a, a big great lake. place to grow up. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds great. What about, uh, dad? Where is he? Where was he? What happened? Uh, he is back and forth from Lincoln, Nebraska and Iran. Uh, he's not a citizen of the United States. I see. Uh, because of that, I'm actually also a citizen of Iran. I have dual citizenship. Interesting. So I have my Iranian passport or certificate ID card. I've, I've never been over there. I, I was supposed to go over there a few years ago and then the, uh, Arab spring happened. Mm -hmm. Um, because of my citizenship, I also have a duty to military service. <laughs> so to go over there during that time didn't seem the most most appropriate action no because you would be in the iranian army <laughs> yeah I, I wouldn't join it here let alone a place where i can't understand what they're yelling at me so. right well you know at least the farsi that's on your body right you know yeah exactly <laughs> I've, I've, I've acknowledged my ethnicity and i'm certainly uh, not uh, shy of it i'm proud of it right uh, it is who i am but yeah my dad you know he i think he had a tough uh, integration in the united states um as did i'm sure a lot of people mm -hmm. um from other countries uh it's it's, it's an interesting interesting feeling, I'm sure, that he had to go through the motions he had to go through to, to integrate and then to go through the divorce like he did yeah. um, to try to find your footing again. It just never really happened. So mm. um, I, I, I think that at this point in my life, I'm probably more of a father to him than he is to me. I, I, uh, I loan him a lot of money, um, <laughs> uh, things like that. And he always pays me back, so it all works out. But right. uh, I, I'd say our relationship now is much better than it was 15 years ago uh, when we were growing up just because of his not being there. And 
As and everyone's an adult now, and everybody understands each other's strengths and weaknesses. That helps. Yeah, and right? I understand that everybody's not perfect anymore. Indeed. And, you know, we have, no matter uh, how many times they prove us wrong, we like to think our parents are perfect and, and know-it-alls when we're younger. And as we grow, we find that's not the case. Yeah, well, my, my parents are perfect, so I, I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. Uh, but uh, certainly, I think understanding your parents as an adult is adds to the relationship in a way that you just can't have as a child, you know? Yeah, without a doubt. I, uh, it's, it's definitely helped for my, you know, again, I, I'm not ready to have kids right now, but uh, just thinking about having them and, and, and how my parents dealt with certain situations and how I deal with them now, there's... There's a lot of similarities, but I think there's a lot of differences as well. And hmm. um, I think that, that a lot of that stems from me having a lot of life experiences before jumping into that. And that's, again, back to Nebraska, something that always scared, scared me was being a parent before you're ready to be a parent. Right. And just ha having all of my friends and family and employees and coworkers have all these children and build these families around me, I've learned a lot about what to do and what not to do. <laughs> so so you, you uh, graduate early and you're off. You're out of Nebraska. Right. Yeah, I, I went to a small technical school in Nebraska. Got mm -hmm. my uh, associate's degree in ar architectural engineering. Uh, oh, wow. Graduated when I was nineteen, and then uh, two days after I graduated, I ended up getting a job with ME Group, uh, which is a mechanical electrical plumbing engineering firm uh, uh -huh. back in Lincoln, based in Lincoln. Uh -huh. And then that was the job that eventually transferred me to Denver uh, one week after my twenty-first birthday. Okay. Twenty-first birthday, you're in Denver. You're and uh, uh, working with Safer and, and doing the whole thing. So it didn't didn't Safer came into the picture probably six to nine months after I moved here. Okay, what well, give us those six to nine months? What happened? Uh, it was me going to this uh, going to this office downtown, mm -hmm. the interior gray cubicle, um, working <laughs> with people that took me a while to understand were pretty much dead inside. <laughs> the type of people that uh, provide their money to their wives who are homebound um, so that they can in turn give their the earner back an, an allowance so they can spend uh, uh -huh. you know people that dressed like it was still in the 70s and I, just people that were pretty stuck right i think and i was starting to feel myself becoming stuck but in those six to nine months you know i lived downtown i worked downtown i went to this bar called shelby's mm -hmm. um, right in between the two and spent most of my time and was really trying to make friends with all the wrong people right <laughs> right um but I, you were 21 right exactly yeah. <laughs> I, I was going i, I never had had that that 21 year old experience yeah. that people have when they go hang out with their friends they go to college they do all that so I was trying to identify that on myself on my own and trying to find people on my own in this professional adult atmosphere and I didn't always handle myself <laughs> in the best way so it's, it's clear early on you are not satisfied with the status quo I'm graduating high school early I walk into this business I can see that something's wrong you know with the the setup the entire setup there's something wrong here are both of your parents Iranian and how did they get to Nebraska and where does that kind of uh, vision thinking come from? Yeah, my my father is Iranian, 100% born mm -hmm. there, moved mm -hmm. to uh, the United States after the Iranian Revolution mm -hmm. in 1979, mm -hmm. like a lot of Iranians did. Uh, my mother is German, English and Cherokee Indian. Um, she was born in Nebraska. Okay. Uh, her father is English and uh, Cherokee Indian and my mother is 100% German. Um, so I'm a mutt. I, I wrote American. To say the least, right? <laughs> I wrote American on my last census. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, so I, but I think I think that definitely made me different to start and yeah. made me think about things differently because yeah. I had this dad that, you know, didn't hang out with the other dads and didn't act like the other dads and and this mom that worked so hard that she didn't have maybe the relationship with me that other moms did with their kids or um, interacted with my friends the way that other moms did. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a little bit secluded. I, I was kind of growing up in Nebraska. I, I always called myself the black kid in my elementary school. Uh -huh. um, so. Well, in Nebraska, <laughs> you probably were, Kayvon, right? Cl close to it. Yeah. You know, exactly. When my father had tried to teach me Farsi when I was younger, I resisted because I didn't want another differentiator. I yeah. Didn't want something else. To That's not going to help me, Dad. <laughs> so uh, it was it was awkward, but I think that having those experiences and and being just uh, subject to another culture at a young age, regardless of what that culture was, really helped me establish just a different way of thinking mm -hmm. and, and a different way of doing things. And even though my dad wasn't uh, very successful at it, I think he always had an entrepreneurial spirit. He always, you know, he came here wanting to do something different, wanting yeah. to do something unique and outside the box. It just never materialized. Right. But I think 
both my parents, if I got anything from them outside of my mom's work ethic, was the ability to take risks and understand that life isn't perfect and mm -hmm. sometimes you just need to push on and that it will get better. Oh, uh, all the time you need to push on. All the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to a detriment, though, sometimes. I mean, sure. I, I find myself working uh, too much. You know, there, there also needs to be an understanding that a social life is important. Sure. And there needs to be some balance, even if it's 95 to 5. Yeah. <laughs> that there needs to be some level of a social life. And that's been very tough for me over the years, um, growing into this this world and this body that we're in in cannabis right now. Yeah. Um, because my it is my social life it's my business life it's everything that i do revolves around cannabis and the people i know in cannabis mm -hmm. and I, it's, I i find it tough but also important to understand that i need to have that separation well let, let's get to that because you are also running more than one business so some of this is your fault it's all, it's, it's certainly all <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh but uh, okay so so we we're in this uh office uh setting which just doesn't seem right for those six to nine months Right. And then, uh, you know, when did you fly the coop and how did you? Yeah. So I, I actually in in uh, my dealings with Safer, I, I started volunteering for Safer two years before I left my engineering job. You did. OK. Yeah. So uh -huh. I, was, I was it was a, it was a slow transition. OK. Because um, I did understand, you know, the cannabis at that time wasn't something I could be making money off of legally or talk about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you would try to talk to people. You know, some of the first things I did was collect signatures to try to get the I-100 initiative on the ballot here in Denver. Right. Or to go raise money. And every time you'd open your mouth about cannabis mm -hmm. reform, um, you'd, you, you were either met with dead silence or opposition. Mm -hmm. um, people People didn't want to even provide you ten dollars uh, towards that support. Um, now they're throwing millions of dollars at the at the the wall. Um, but <laughs> that that taught me how difficult it actually was, and to have people like Steve Fox and and Mason Tavert get that opposition on a daily basis, and to have. 99 out of 100 people tell them that their efforts are futile, that it was worthless, and to see them push on and, and to, for that to make them stronger was really what set, I think, my drive um, in the cannabis industry. So um, again, this is advocacy. I can make money off of it. So it was more of a hobby. It was a side thing. It was a social thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I got to a point at the engineering job where the, the gray interior and the, the dead soul people that I was working with really started to get to me. And I remember walking into work one morning. I, I live uh, pretty close to downtown town so i'd walk to the light rail station and take that and hop off and i always had my earbuds in listening to music and i think it was like the third day in a row i was going up the elevator and the exact same song was playing in my earbuds like going <laughs> up to this job that i just despised and i was like i got to do something about this and yeah. i sat down at my desk and you know mind you i was i was getting paid very well full health dental vision retirement plan stock in the company was an associate with the firm went from drafts person to associate. I, I, I was working 20 hours a week out of a full-time job just because I was so efficient and good at it. Mm -hmm. but I just couldn't do it anymore. I didn't, I didn't love it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I sat down at the desk that morning and I immediately wrote my, my two weeks notice uh, to my boss uh, without knowing I was going to do it when I woke up that morning and just said, I just can't do this anymore. I'll stay as long as you need me to do, but I cannot do this anymore. And my boss came over to me immediately after getting that email and said, you can go. And so when I woke up that morning, I had this job and, and, Two hours later, I didn't have this anymore and uh, ended up uh, within the next couple months breaking up with the lady that I was living with that I was about ready to get married to. Uh -huh. I was about 30 pounds heavier than I am now uh -huh. um, and just unhappy on multiple levels, even outside the job. So broke up, um, ended up buying an existing pizzeria in Capitol Hill here in Denver with Evan Ackerfeld, the assistant director of Safer. Right. And uh, we had never made pizza before. We had never owned a restaurant. We had never managed employees. We had never done any of this. Yeah. And just took a whim. I emptied out my savings, my 401k, my IRA, maxed out my credit card debt, borrowed money from family to buy this place, and just went on a whim. I, I ended up renting the house out that I had owned, yeah. uh, that I owned at the time, still living it now. Mm -hmm. I moved into the backyard uh, in a tent. Uh, for three months um, and then moved on to a buddy's floor for another six months uh, during the first nine months of owning sexy pizza so I really just hit the reset button on life i couldn't couldn't do it anymore i was i was gonna say you know we know it's sexy pizza and just everything about your life at that point was not sexy in any way. And, and somehow so. I still maintained a girlfriend living in a tent. <laughs> yeah. Did you really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, broke up with the one and, and then uh, took up with another. Yeah, I, I had been in a series, a string of long-term relationships relationships up to that point. And yeah. Because of my you know living on my own at an early age and working so much, I never had the opportunity to just go out and philander. <laughs> sure. You know, and to, to get out there and meet people. And, and, uh, and I finally had that chance when I seemingly lost lost 
all responsibility for nine months outside of just focusing on making this pizzeria work and yeah. learning, learning about the business. So, well, uh, what? How do you uh, tell someone that you live in a tent? You take them to it, <laughs> and you say, "See, it's not as bad as it sounds." Um, oh, but it is, though, Kayvon. Right? I mean, come on. <laughs> it, it it was, but it wasn't. There was a there was definitely a sense of freedom involved with okay. not having any possessions, not having any things, really going the full minimalist route and and hitting that reset button. Again, I was just so very unhappy at the time that I needed some sort of grand change. It wasn't going to be this incremental chip away of change that was going to do what I needed to right. be happy at the time. And I think that's something that a lot of people lose sight of, um, that when we, you know, we get, we get put into these these mills and these pathways of uh, go to college and get this job and work these hours and have these expectations with regard to marriage and children and buying a house and all that. And it, it's not to say that that's wrong or there's anything wrong with that, but I, I think for anybody that truly wants to be an entrepreneur, anybody that truly wants to incite grand change, you have to be okay with grand change. Yeah. You have to be okay with not living up to somebody else's expectations for you or, mm. or, um, you know, feeling that your friends are accom seemingly accomplishing more uh, because they do have these families built and these jobs that they're happy with and all that. Um, I, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur and that wasn't going to happen if I was quitting that engineering job to go get another full-time job. Yeah. You know, I needed to, to, to deal with those punches I needed to bootstrap, I needed to feel the pain. And that was really the climax of that pain was living in that tent and not having any money and eating pizza every day for nine months every meal. Yeah, why, I mean, is did pizza seem easy? Why, why decide on a restaurant? Why decide on pizza? So Evan and another initial partner we had who was uh, Safer's only employee at the time outside of Evan uh, were from Huntington, Long Island. And they always had a desire to open a pizza place right. called Sexy Pizza. And why Sexy Pizza? I mean, there's nothing sexy about pizza. There's no stripper poles in it. We don't, you know, put one pepperoni in the middle to, to make it seem like it's a boob. It's, it's, it's simply to incite a curiosity. And if, if people are curious enough to come in the doors and the food's good enough to bring them back, then we've accomplished our mission. There you go. Um, but something that was important also with Sexy Pizza and something that we've never really, I think, fully realized, but I've always had in the back of my head is to what's sexy about it is our community-driven uh, engagement, our involvement, our desire to stay engaged in drug policy, understanding that that's where we came from. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had you know four pizzas almost since day one that every time somebody purchased one of these pizzas, we donated a dollar to that organization. Safer was the first one. So we, we coined the Safer Pie. Mm -hmm. And now uh, you know drug policy, we had Sensible Colorado on there initially too. Because of the cannabis progress those groups have made here in Colorado, um, we got rid of those and went into more mainstream groups. Like we have a veterans group, oh, good. Um, Colorado Youth Symphony Orchestra, which I sit on the board of directors for, mm -hmm. um, has a, a pizza as well. Uh, the Harm Reduction Action Center, which is the largest needle exchange in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, just wanting to continue to give back, wanting to, you know, we feed homeless children through Stand Up For Kids at Sexy Pizza. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really moved into where we are now a sex pot. Like the reason sex pot exists is because of uh, finding a different way to spend our money, you know, not not looking at it as, um, you know, a lot of people have a marketing budget and then they have money they're willing to donate. And mm -hmm. I, I view a marketing budget as money I'm willing to donate, mm -hmm. um, especially in a place like Colorado that really thrives on small business, on community engagement, on finding a different way to do things that's outside of kind of corporate purview and, and national ways of doing things. I think Colorado is unique because we are primarily imports. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we exist of, we consist of people that are from other places around the country that wanted to get away from something. They mm -hmm. came here to start a new life and it's this new frontier mentality. Um, so we've, we've done that and sex pot was formed because I, I trashed the marketing budget at sexy pizza. One day I, I was looking at how we were spending our money and I put an ad in Westward, which is the village voice paper here mm -hmm. it was a quarter page ad. I think it cost me like $900 for the week mm -hmm. and their distributions probably 80, 90, a hundred thousand dollars. I got three coupons back. And I was like, there's got to be better ways to spend this money, <laughs> yeah. especially $900 a week. Sure. So I, I started to have uh, these people that were running comedy shows in the neighborhood where Sexy Pizza's at come to me and say, you want a sponsor? I'm like, how much is a sponsor? They say, oh, two, three hundred bucks a month. Seems reasonable. Right. Right. I mean, instead of getting three coupons out of this wide audience, or maybe I'm getting a little visibility, yeah. I can engage with 50 to 60 to 70 people in this room that are looking at my banner, that are getting a stage mention, that are getting a free slice card. Yeah. 
and spending you know one tenth of the money and actually getting much more out of it. Mm. So all of all of sexy uh, sexy pizza's marketing budget right now goes to sponsoring comedy and music and art and all of that because we're engaging with the people that actually shop as opposed to trying to encourage other people um, that are way outside of our box uh, mm -hmm. to try to come in. You know, mm -hmm. we're we're building word of mouth. We're building building people that are that are talking about us. Yeah, and so we we've uh, talked about sexy pizza. We now just talked about sex pot, and we'll, we'll kind of come back to that. Um, y y the giving. Uh, thing through a dollar for every pie or for, for one of the four pies um you mentioned you know making sure to kind of follow your own path and we talked through why and how and that all makes sense you also mentioned almost one of the first things that you said i wanted to meet people through giving how was that part of you as a 21 year old person where does that come from it's uh, a good question um I, I can't say that I necessarily volunteered a lot when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just saw in my family on my mom's side <clears throat> just how tremendously giving they were and how understanding they were. And, and I guess moving into a bigger city like Denver, I started to see some of the ugly sides of people mm -hmm. a little more than I did in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. you know, Lincoln, Nebraska, it's a pretty small town. It's, it's very nice. It's very polite. You get to Denver and I, I lost some of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that I just wanted to make sure that when I was moving here that I was latching on to good people. Mm -hmm. um, because I've seen from my, you know, my younger years the effects of associating with bad people and the, the path that that can lead you down, right. um, both in business and in, in family and friends. So I think I just wanted to make sure that I was getting off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were looking for places that gave, you know, pl places that were doing something positive for the people around us. And that uh, follows you through. We're going to talk about all that. Sexpot's been going for the past few years. Let's get from the beginning of Sexy Pizza to the beginning of Sexpot through, uh, I'm trying to think what else happened in between. Oh. Everything. Sure. <laughs> yeah, Sexy Pizza started, um, again, at the time I was living in the tent. Right. Um, again, didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. So we actually had the existing name of the place, Pizza Vera. Uh, maintain be maintained for the first nine months mm -hmm. um, because we knew we were going to make mistakes and we didn't want that to be associated with this new brand that we were going to try to create. Uh -huh. So we kept the existing employees, we kept the existing menu, we kept the existing decor and uh, made our mistakes. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a place that had gone so far away from its initial intentions as a pizza place and all of a sudden had hamburgers and nachos and burritos and gyros and it was one of those places, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we wanted to get rid of that and we wanted it to make more of a, a New York style um, but not, I always hate that term New York style because it's not New York style. It's it, it maybe has influences there, but it's Denver pizza, right? Sure. Um, I, I don't. I never. I never like to say that in front of New York people because they're like, ah, it's not that like New York. <laughs> um, and well, I, because what we'll say is it's all about the water. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah all about the water. And <laughs> yeah. So Rosenberg's Deli here is apparently uh, du duplicated that by chemically treating their water to match up to what New York has coming out. I'm sure they whatever. do. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, people are doing that. So, you can trust the Rosenbergs. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we made our mistakes. Uh, we ended up, you know, uh, interviewing the right people, hiring the right people, getting our menu uh, down, getting our brand down, and then remodeling the place, and then opening nine months later with Sexy Pizza. Right. Once that had happened, I was kind of uh, put, pulling back from my duties there because that Already? Was, it just opened? Yeah, but it, but it, but it wasn't my vision. You know, This was okay. like my transition. Okay. And, I, almost every business I've started, Denver Leaf uh, included, Sexpot included, Birdie mm -hmm. Magazine included, mm -hmm. were somebody else's ideas or somebody else's vision that I, I helped bring to fruition. Okay. Um, so in Sexy Pizza, I was, uh, you know, just through my entrepreneurial spirit, had more business experience than my friends. So helped them drive in the right direction and, and helped establish standards from my experience working in a restaurant back in Nebraska. I was a, went from busboy to assistant GM at a private dining club mm -hmm. um, in Nebraska over my six-year tenure there. So I had some management experience and, and understanding par levels and scheduling and things like that to apply to it. Right. Um, but I wanted to do something else. And now that I had the engineering uh, beyond my mind and Sexy Pizza still isn't making money because it was a startup, I needed to do something to make money. Mm -hmm. And that's where Denver Relief came in. Mm -hmm. um, this was at a time when um, Obama had just uh, said, you know, he'd been elected in November and, and said in December that, it, again, reiterated that he wasn't going to use federal resources to go after state compliant businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's when the Green Rush started in, in Colorado. This would have been late 2008. 
Yes. Sure. Late well, 2008. Or, yeah, early 2009, whichever. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, the, but it was actually New Year's Eve oh, okay. of 2008. Um, so on the eve of 2009, right. that Denver Relief was fully kind of conjured up. Okay. Um, and it was actually uh, based on a uh, use of with uh, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, <laughs> I was hanging out with a buddy of mine, one of the initial founders of Denver Relief, who's no longer on board, and Evan and Scott from Sexy Pizza. And it was like the sun was coming up. It was the end of a very long day, new 2009. And we just brought up, why not? Why not get involved in this? Like everybody else was talking, we had seen some dispensaries crop up. Uh, the initial partner that I was talking about was growing wonderful cannabis, had some unique genetics from Ohio that we still have downstairs. Mm -hmm. and, and we said, let's give this a shot. You know, we didn't have any money. Um, I had some business experience. He had the grower. Mm -hmm. We didn't have really access to the patients, which is our big problem because right. he wanted to grow on what he had. We were operating under the caregiver model back then. So what we could grow is dictated by how many patients we had. You need a guy with patients is what you, you do. You need a guy with patients. We need a guy that knew a doctor that was willing to write recommendations at the time. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there were very few because it was so ambiguous. There was, there was, it was so vague, the rules and the laws surrounding this. And people were very much in fear of losing their licenses, writing these recommendations, going against federal law. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's where Ian came in the picture. There you go. And Ian at the time was helping folks get uh, um, doctor's referrals and, and was helping folks with the paperwork and facilitating that and in turn getting paid a fee for it. And we worked with an 80 plus year old gentleman, a psychiatrist in Cherry Creek, um, who was willing to write, write these recommendations. So I ended up getting my card through Ian. Um, he helped Adam, our initial partner, mm -hmm. establish the patient base so that he could grow his grow uh, legally on the caregiver level. Mm -hmm. And we decided to give it a go, give it a run at it. Ian and I started Denver Relief knowing each other for about one week. That's crazy. Yeah, and, and we're, we're the two partners remaining, and the third one that I had an existing relationship is long gone right? Um, for, for reasons that we can maybe get into. Um, but, oh, well, then let's. We didn't get into it with Ian. <laughs> he was, uh, he was a, a bit of a hothead, a little bit of a head case, um, uh, physically assaulted Ian, uh, threatened me with violence. And as soon as he threatened me with violence, I said, enough's enough, and yeah. changed all the locks and said, don't come back. So ended up engaging. Uh, it, was, it was not funny, but um, I don't know where this fits in the timeline. It would have been 2009, 10, and 11. Okay. I actually went and got into a partnership dispute with my initial partners at Sexy Pizza, uh -huh. those two guys. Yeah. Um, they were not understanding of what was necessary to make a business profitable on the front end mm -hmm. and actually walked out on a busy Friday. The two managers, the two operators walked out on a busy Friday. Um, so we ended up getting into a partnership dispute into uh, arbitration for a little over a year. Yeah. The week that ended, I ended up getting into a, the partnership dispute at Denver oh, Relief, and that, that lasted for another nine months. Oh. So I took my beatings on, you know, <laughs> partners for a while. So I'm very selective of who I choose to go into business with anymore. Yeah, no, that's fair. Uh, what though would your lessons learned be from those two kind of let's call them altercations? Um, you know, if it takes two to tango, what, what was your part there and what did you learn if anything i think that it served me really well in the cannabis space because i think this is the biggest issue the cannabis industry faces right now is expectations yeah and whether you're an investor that doesn't understand the industry whether you're an operator that doesn't understand money or business whether you're a um you know it's anybody nobody nobody really truly understands cannabis mm -hmm. uh, in the industry and where it's going myself included i mean anybody that says they know where this industry is truly headed is, is wrong. The, it's, well, everything we're doing today is going to look sophomoric in two years. That's how quickly things are changing. Well, from an industry perspective, it's it's a shotgun uh, start, even though it started in uh, 2004 or whatever. Uh, it's a shotgun for, for this current uh, take, which is why you say in two years it's going to be uh, kind of obsolete what we're doing now. But also, as far as cannabis is concerned, we haven't been able to research the plant. So yes, no one truly knows what's going on. Yep. And, it, and it's understanding that and having that expectation that anything could change on a moment's notice and that, you know, yes, we're going to go spend $250,000 on these lights. They might not be worth the shit in 12 months. You know? right. like, like, but it, 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 it's having these conversations on the front end and, and, and meticulously documenting expectations, not what we're going to be doing necessarily, 
but understanding what we're going to start off doing and then how we're going to revise that and make that malleable as we move forward. Mm. Because if you want to stay competitive, you have to be malleable in this industry. And I think that we've could have gotten a long way uh, with documenting those expectations for our partners on the front end. So, sure. you know, working with uh, people like Cresco Labs in Illinois now and some of the clients we have in Nevada, I'm really seeing, and I don't have any business experience. I never went to school for it. You know, this is all self-taught. I, yeah. Everything that I'm doing, I'm learning as I go. So to be working with these people who have had tremendous success in traditional business environments, I'm, I'm learning a lot every day. And it's really nice to see that they have that, that same mindset to where we need to document meticulously up front what these expectations are, what our roles are, and what's going to happen if we don't fulfill those. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a change in role and responsibility or compensation or equity or, or what needs to happen, just having that picture painted on the front end, I think, is the biggest thing that I could... Um, push out there as, as a lesson learned. And and I do want to talk about uh, consulting. I want to talk about the Denver Relief days before consulting happened. And I do want to actually, before any of that, uh, you, you mentioned it. You said, I, I don't have any business experience. And you've got the, you, you know, your dad who kind of tried to make stuff work in a couple of different ways and still does. And you got your mom who basically is a worker, you know, two different jobs and ma just making it happen. Where is this, uh, where's the light from? Where, I mean, you know, being able to put things together like this in a number of different ways, you're talking comedy, you're talking pizza, you're talking cannabis, you know, you're talking consulting. Where do you think it comes from? You, you, you admitted that you, it wasn't taught to you, fine. I, you know, I, I think about that a lot, I really do. And I've thought about it throughout my life and I have, I have honestly, I have no clue. I mean, I, I almost feel and this, I, I'm not a religious person. I've never been to a church service in my life. Uh, but sometimes I almost feel like things are just planned or destined or uh, even if not, if it, it's not the success, but the path that mm -hmm. I'm on. Like it, things just seem to fall into place. Good people seem to come in my life at appropriate times. Opportunities seem to present themselves at appropriate times. And I don't know if that, you know, maybe it's just me taking advantage of them and understanding them and seeing them more clearly and, and how they fit together on some macro level. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I've always wondered that myself. I mean, none of these things, again, were my ideas. They were ideas that were brought to me by other people that had a passion for it. And I was able to find my own passions in it and to, to make them succeed. Yeah. Um, but I really don't know. I've always struggled to answer that question because I've been asked a lot and I have no clue where it comes from. I, I think I just feed off of the people around me. Yeah. And you do so well. That's, uh, I think, the key. Because a lot of people feed off the people around them. Yeah. <laughs> not, I, in, in, not, not in the best way. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I've always, I had, I had a, a quote in a, an interview a couple of years ago that really is how I, uh, what I think is the main determinator of my success is the fact that I hire people smarter than me. Sure. You know, I, I engage people that know something about something, know more about something than I do. Um, and they, they have their own skill and passion for that one thing. And it's about fitting those pieces together. So I think more than anything, I'm a resource manager, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whether it be money or human or, or whatever, opportunity resources, um, just managing those and pushing forward on them. Um, I think my issue, and I'm starting to realize this, is that I can probably take on too much and stretch myself a little thin. So being cognizant of when to put on the brakes yeah. or um, to say, no, now is not the right time for this. Um, that's, that's an issue that I'm dealing with. Cause I don't want to you know, take Denver relief consulting. We turn away, you know, 99 out of a hundred people that want to engage in our services. And it's not that I want to turn them away, but I also don't want to be a massive company. You know, right. I want to, I want to be a boutique firm. I want to be able to have personal relationships with the people we work with and to have them be partners like all of my other partners are where we're friends, where we're, in, we're engaged with each other, where we re appreciate and respect each other and have an ongoing relationship with each other. That's important to me in my business. And mm. maybe that's why it's been successful. I've always had a very personal relationship with my businesses. I've never had the mindset that, okay, I'm going to grow you and I'm going to forget about you and let mm. somebody else, you know, be somebody else's problem. Business is personal. <laughs> And I don't think a lot of people have that mindset, though. Right. I think they see it as I'm going to put in this investment, I'm going to put in this documented effort for this period of time, and then I'm going to cut it loose. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've just never looked at it that way. I, I've, I've always said if I'm going to engage in something, that this is going to become a part of my life. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, so talk about the Denver Relief years. We're trying to dot the line here. So before we got into consulting, you know, uh, y y you had 1284 happen while you, you know, while you guys were in operation. Take us through it. Yeah. Yeah, so even even before that, we uh, after that the Obama 
deal. You know, we, we wanted to start our business, but we didn't have the money. Mm-hmm. So we actually started Denver Leaf, which the DR, DRC were formed from $4,000 and half a pound of cannabis. Right. And again, it was a bootstrapped uh, endeavor. And we started as a delivery service. So Ian and I were the uh, delivery people. And we operated out of our house. Uh, we took the calls every day. We made the runs every day, alternated days, and Adam grew. And that got to the point to where we were uh, getting busy enough where we couldn't handle it ourselves. So we hired a delivery driver on each day. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, Ian and I became dispatchers. And we were taking orders and preparing them and then sending people out on deliveries and compensating people for uh, the miles they drove and hourly wages and stuff like that. Um, We actually applied. um, We opened downstairs, I'm sorry, um, January 1st of 2010. Oh, okay. January 3rd of 2010. So after about a year after we kind of came up with the idea for DR, mm-hmm. we started delivering in May mm-hmm. of 2009 and then saved enough money to eventually le- lease out the space and build it out downstairs, which is our current location. Um, we, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was a total delivery service and, and a bootstrap uh, deal and also getting those patients because you know if we were going to open this retail store we needed to have enough product to support probably the business that we were going to be getting so we had to make sure the patient base was there yeah. and we grew that and you know, I like to think we did so with uh, great customer service just like I think we offer downstairs today that's one of our founding principles community integration we we, we wanted to do things in a different way and change perception of cannabis uh, from day one so we tried to do that and just how we in- interacted with people and most people back then especially and still today to some extent still have this kind of subculture stoner mentality and that's fine Mm -hmm. you know but the thing about cannabis that i learned from safer and sensible was that even though that was what you saw in the news even though that was what you um you know the most people you engaged with that admitted to consuming cannabis acted like that was very that wasn't very indicative of the, the overall cannabis user Mm-hmm. The overall cannabis user was everybody. It was mm-hmm. just like people who drank. It was the soccer mom and the attorney and the doctor and the politician and, and the average Joe, the tech worker, whoever. Those are the people I think that uh, on the, on uh, when we first got started were really attracted to us just because we weren't that subculture mentality. So we started to get more of these professional types, these more fluent people mm-hmm. that would order from us. And the fact that we could go deliver to their house uh, was a huge benefit to them. Sure. Um, but yeah, we ended up opening the store downstairs and uh, then, you know, right after that had to start uh, raising money and saving money to build out our growth facility. Because when, um, when, medical regs first did come down i mean it was a very distinct line that said by this day you have to be operating and denver said in denver if you're mm-hmm. selling cannabis in denver it's got to be grown in denver if you're selling an infused product it's got to be manufactured in denver mm-hmm. we were still growing at this house in idaho springs up in the mountains not gonna work so okay we we finally find this property i think the whole timeline of when we were told we had to do this to when um, we had to have it done by was like four or five months. Yeah, that's so, cannabis time. That, that's what happens, right? So they said, okay, go find this commercial property when everybody else is looking for one, right. negotiate a lease, hire your design firm, get the design done, get through permitting, get through construction, become operational in four months. Yeah. Physically impossible. Um, so we, we ended up getting it done, but we ended up, I mean, borrowing $300,000 from patients, from right. employees, from la- uh, landlords, from parents, uh, destroyed my credit. Um, if I thought I was poor when I lived in that tent when I started Sexy Pizza, that was nothing compared to what I was dealing with when we started Denver Leaf and actually grew out this. And it was probably the most frustrating time in my life because I had, um, you know, that we could start to see the on the surface of things that were happening with our third partner. Mm-hmm. Um, Ian and him didn't get along. Ian and I really didn't get along. Mm-hmm. Um, Adam and I would have our own friction. So we had like these three partners that were kind of on this island mm-hmm. for a while because we we're all dealing with something brand new. We didn't know what was coming down the pipe. We we're all very scared of losing this thing that we had worked so hard to build for so long um, but we just kept pushing yeah and um, the retail really started picking up you know we got kind of it, it, it looks almost exactly the same as it did five years ago so I think we're a little ahead of our time with regard to how we presented ourselves you know? okay uh, go, going back to changing perception, we wanted to make more of a doctor's office. We wanted to have people wear uniforms and polo shirts and just wanted people to interact with folks in a way that I considered better than that subculture movement to where it was tilted hats and bros and bras and right. you know things of that nature. And that worked for a very long time. Um, we're starting to see 
everybody really level out with regard to customer service and product quality and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting to, to, to be on that front, front end where we were delivering to get into that initial retail and now see the industry evolve into what it is now. It's a, uh, I've seen a lot of contrast, a lot of change. Sure. No, unbelievable. As, as far as uh, consulting, let's dive into that now. When did that come about? You know, how, how quickly did you guys realize, okay, people see that we know what we're doing. Yeah, I think when we were established um, downstairs and we felt really good about it, um, <clears throat> I had made uh, the recommendation to Ian um, that he kind of move out of the operations downstairs and get into um, government relations and dealing with the industry groups. And, you know, we, we, we like to consider ourselves uh, to be back then per compliance impeccable operators. And Mm -hmm. even if there was a gray area in the law that there was a black and white definition that we could apply to it, Mm -hmm. right? Let's, let's err on the conservative side with everything because we want to be people who are again, progressing the image of this industry and not sticking to the status quo. Mm -hmm. So, and that reputation has lended very well to us and and it's built over time. And that's what's what made Denver Relief Consulting possible is the fact that we, you know, we were willing to go to our competition across the street and down the street four blocks and help them stay in business by getting them prepared for compliance audits and and making sure that they knew what to expect when the state and the city came knocking to what what was the thought there to, to help out the competition literally because back to you know what steve and mason instilled in me is even if there's competition even if there's people that we don't fully agree with um whether with regard to business or perception um that if 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 they have a black eye associated with their business and how they do that business, operate that business, that that's a black eye that is thrust on us as, as well because we're all members of this collective industry that mm. at the time, and it still exists today to an extent, but it didn't matter how good or bad of an operator you were five years ago, you were a cannabis operator. And whatever you saw in the news, that, that was how everybody perceived you. So you are the same as the guy across the street and down the street no matter what. So if I'm the same as them, well, better help them out. Yeah, ninety-eight percent of people that live in the state never came into a cannabis dispensary. Ninety-nine, right. maybe. You know, right. so we're one percent of the people knew the difference, but most most society didn't. Most of society didn't. So we wanted to just help everybody elevate themselves. Mm-hmm. And well, what is it when they say when the tide rises, all, all ships rise, yeah. right? And, and that that's really what we wanted to get across. So um, we did that for a while, and then we started seeing the consolidation come down in the industry when when. Uh, Hospital 1284 came through. Mm-hmm. We started to see places like the clinic and Strainwise and Lightshade and Pink House and all of these places open up new locations everywhere. And we looked at that ourselves and said, is that something we really want to do? You know, we had this this iconic place, which is the oldest dispensary in Denver at the zero zero block in the mm-hmm. capital city, the state that's driving this movement. It's mm-hmm. like it's an iconic thing. Do we really want to dilute that by opening these other stores when we're we're already admitting of the fact that day to day operations aren't our favorite thing? Mm-hmm. You know, we I like to consider myself again more of a macro resource thinker, not uh, dealing with the intricacies of why the cash didn't match up with the drawer today. Right. And and not that there's anything wrong with that, and I want to instill those practices in others, but I don't want to do it myself. Right. So we saw how can we continue to be advocates and and progressors in the industry um, without opening more stores. You mm-hmm. know, to be a big name in Colorado, that's great. But I'd rather be a big name everywhere, you know, and if, even if not a big name, an influencer. Right. And an important name. An important name. Right. And what we saw were, were these uh, application processes starting in Massachusetts and Connecticut. So Connecticut was our first client. Um, and that his his contract actually funded our initial efforts with Denver Relief Consulting. Mm-hmm. Um, so we saw that, OK. Even if they don't want our name, we're not gonna we're not gonna make it Massachusetts relief or Connecticut relief. We can we can apply our model sure. um, to what they're doing. We can apply the lessons learned, the mistakes made to their operations to help them get off the uh, off the ground right. Because ultimately, if they don't have somebody that's been through those experiences before, there's nowhere online they could look. There's no book they can read about experiences in the cannabis industry and what to avoid and pitfalls mm-hmm. and hurdles. It's a very different time than it is now. To where now there's still not that, but there's a lot more resources out there. Yeah, and there was no place that they could look at back then. So to tie an operator like ourselves to it. Uh, we ended up working with Brett. We actually had uh, in Connecticut, we worked with the city of Middletown, Connecticut, did city council presentations, engaged with the uh, mayor, city council, police chief, everybody, actually leased a city owned building 
um, to put the cannabis operation in, hmm. um, which was way ahead of its time. You know, we're starting to see stuff like that happen now, but that was way ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. And it was because of all of these other things that we had really tried to do here in Colorado with Denver Relief, but mm -hmm. didn't really have the resources and the funds to make big. Mm -hmm. And that was the community integration piece and, and throwing ourselves out there with our green team. Like we have at DR with the free bicycle wheelchair repair clinics and the college scholarships and the urban gardening and perpetual food coat clothing, hygiene product collection drives, showing that we're, we're just as, if not more responsible than any other traditional business that's out there, that we're here to stay in the cannabis industry and that we can be good, progressive, contributing members of society. Mm -hmm. Substance abuse and talking about how cannabis can affect the opiate overdose discussion, the opiate dependency discussion, both with painkillers and with heroin, mm -hmm. which is becoming a massive drug uh, of importance to, 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 to discuss these days, mm -hmm. um, to talk about environmental stewardship and, and understanding that four and a half million square feet of warehouse space in Denver County alone are uh, in existence for the purposes of cultivating or manufacturing cannabis and that we're taking up 10% of Denver's electrical demand for cannabis cultivation. Mm -hmm. um, to talk about research and what we're doing with the Cannabis Genome Research Initiative uh, that stemmed from uh, UC Boulder and talking about how do these cannabinoid profiles relate to the treatment of these conditions. And if we're finding certain patterns in DNA that are creating these profiles and that these profiles are best to treat these conditions, how can we breed strains specifically for the treatment of certain conditions. Mm -hmm. And but building this narrative into what we're sending in uh, on these applications with this local team that has their political connections and their clout and, and already has their goodwill associated with where they live, um, we saw that as an opportunity to change the landscape and the discussion. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And I think um, we're a part of that along with people like Forefront and, and Chris Crane sure. um, to really change the discussion about how we should be approaching this. And this isn't California. This isn't Colorado mm -hmm. anymore. This this isn't that underground subculture again. Mm -hmm. You don't go to Massachusetts and have a California mentality and think you're going to get very far. No, nope. um, It's an entirely different dynamic. So balancing that local uh, dynamic, that local culture with uh, traditional cannabis experience with this progress that nobody even knows what it looks like yet and trying to meld that uh, was really what we did and it, it's been successful you know we we only we went one for two in Connecticut um, we only had one out of our nine in Massachusetts come through um, and at that point I was a little bit discouraged I was you know I, was, I, I didn't I, I honestly questioned whether what we were doing at Denver Relief Consulting was right Huh. Um, you know, there were all the lawsuits that came up in Massachusetts. We found out that there were all sorts of issues with, um, you know, political favoritism and lying about local approval and yada, yada, yada. It goes on and on. And I don't, we just kind of hit the brakes for a second mm -hmm. and, and questioned whether this is what we wanted to be doing. But we ended up assisting some folks in Canada. We ended up assisting somebody in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody... It, it seemed to go well and we had Nevada and Illinois pop back up on the radar right we said all right well we'll give this another shot but we're gonna we're gonna approach it a little differently Massachusetts we work with nine teams way too much you mm -hmm. know going back to expectations I didn't clearly define I'll take blame for this on the front end exactly what we were doing and what our clients were doing so we all wanted to get it done. We we're willing to put in as much effort as we had to but the resources just simply weren't there to tackle what we needed to tackle to be competitive mm -hmm. right so I said in these new states, let's see, let's work with fewer teams. Let's work with people that are probably more um, successful and known uh, where they're from. Because that was another thing that I think hurt us in those first two states was we wanted to work with people that were very similar to us, that maybe didn't have all the resources available, that didn't have the clout, the money, the experience um, to really take this on. But what we found in Nevada, Illinois, is we're working with wonderfully intelligent, successful people in traditional business, philanthropists, um, people that have name recognition and goodwill in these places, and allowing them to throw whatever needs to get thrown at this to make it as successful as possible. And that's mm -hmm. not always money, but that's mm -hmm. effort. And that's yeah. understand that sometimes you got to work a 24 hour day to get something done. Right. <laughs> and um, I, we, we had success that I, I again, didn't, didn't expect. Nevada, we went 11 for 11. I know everybody won cultivation manufacturing licenses pretty much that applied, but we won five of the 60-some dispensaries. And then in Illinois, I mean, we were almost told flat out by the Department of Ag in Illinois that we were, you know, nobody was going to get more than one cultivation license. Mm -hmm. So we had a, our Cresco team, which we're partners on, applied for three. And then we worked with another uh, team, Progressive Treatment Solutions, as an advisor um, on another two. We said, okay, if we get one of each, we're going to be looking pretty good. Right. Scores came out, and we ended up getting the top three scores for cultivation uh, in the state out of the 17 licenses issued um, with our Cresco Labs team. 
So all of a sudden we're standing up, you know, three, 40,000 square foot facilities in different parts of the state mm. when we thought we were going to be dealing with one. Mm -hmm. And then also dealing with advising on these other two that uh, one of them's already won in East St. Louis and we're probably going to get the second uh, in Bensonville once this lawsuit clears up. So we're going to be working with five out of the 18 cultivation manufacturing licenses in Illinois when we thought maybe we'd have one. Right. That we're going to be assisted. If we get lucky. Yeah. So we went from being totally discouraged and having zero, almost zero success in Massachusetts and Connecticut to here being on top of the world yeah. um, and, and having unprecedented success. And so now we're taking those lessons learned again and, and that model and, and building and expanding on it again and, and currently um, uh, submitting in Florida next week um, with a client, um, uh, coordinating our final, or I should say negotiating our final relationships in Maryland uh, for two teams that we're working with there. Mm -hmm. And we have two teams in Pennsylvania that we're working with, probably bring on a third. Um, we have a client in Alaska getting prepared for their recreational. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, we're entertaining 15 inquiries in Hawaii right now, but probably going to end up working with an existing client who has relationships there. Okay. Um, and just seeing what, what these new states bring. Ohio, I, right before you came, I was just meeting with one of the, one of the 10 um, <laughs> that have that, that market cornered there. So um, it's, it's getting tougher to maintain um, what we wanted to do at the outset, which is to work with great people because mm -hmm. I think the more money you get, the more impressive you can look regardless. You can make yourself look. Absolutely. Right? You, can, you can paint whatever picture you want for yourself. Sure. Um, so it takes a little more digging to yeah. understand who we're working with, a little more vetting to ask around and and to, to really know who we're, who, we're, who we're dealing with. But I, I feel really good about the folks that we're working with. And I think they're, they're going to continue to change that discussion um, about cannabis and the, the perception that cannabis has. I, I know Cresco Labs per, uh, specifically I don't think there's anybody in cannabis that's going to be doing more than they are in the next two years. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to change the game in cannabis uh, with the approach that they're taking. What, how so? Uh, I think when it comes to branding and product development and engaging traditional industries, um, I, I won't say some of the names uh, just because of non-disclosure, but there's some massive traditional industries on the medical and pharmaceutical side in Illinois um, that we're collaborating with on product development. Mm. Um, you know, there's the the approach to education and wanting to be the resource for uh, Illinois, not for patients of Cresco products, mm -hmm. people that buy Cresco products, but to be that resource now mm -hmm. um, to look at every ancillary opportunity which is what Ian handles for us now um, building relationships if, if you need it for this industry we want a relationship and a packaging and point of sale and insurance and uh, technology and social media and all of this lighting and whatever right let's bring it under our umbrella you yeah know, we want to have our hands in everything whether it be an ownership or royalty or referral fee whatever yeah uh, we want to have that Cresco's taking it one step further and saying okay I know this guy that's uh, you know started this major software company that everybody knows the name of back in the 80s mm -hmm. let's bring them in and have them create a seed to sale right. tracking system let's have them change the dynamic and take all of these existing uh, ancillary partnerships that we have and see how they can start collaborating with each other. And, and mm -hmm. we start to see this compounding effect when we get all these intelligent people that have been working on their own things start to work together and to build something bigger. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that these publicly traded companies have tried to do, mm -hmm. or at least gave the perception that they're trying to do, but they're not. You right. know, they're, they're hampered by making decisions that are solely based on money that are not based on necessarily progress or ethics. And I think that when we tie those two things into the minds of the money that we're dealing with, that we're going to do some very cool things. Yeah. And I, I mean across this industry. There's isn't one piece that's going to be untouched by people like Cresco and, and DRC in the future, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and to that end, you mentioned Ohio, uh, Hawaii, Florida, Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, Alaska. Um, without getting into each of those, I think that that's another conversation that we could have in the future. Um, what are you seeing uh, now in uh, the application process or in getting businesses going uh, across the board? So how is Ohio similar to Hawaii, similar to Maryland? We know that they're all different. We know that everybody's going about it their own ways. What do you see as a similarity? Similarity is <clears throat> larger markets, fewer licenses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Illinois, 18, 18 cultivation, Ohio, 10, Maryland, 15, mm -hmm. um, limited licenses. And it, it, it's really, it really creates a different market than what we have here in Colorado or Washington or California, where there's large markets there, but there's also 200 dispensaries in Denver. There's right. also, you know, there's, we, we, we are allowed and are able to be a niche provider 
in Denver relief in Denver. Mm -hmm. We can't do that if we go to Illinois or Ohio. We have to be considerate of every demographic. Mm -hmm. The fact that we are want, we need to provide economically, uh, uh, you know, money. Or I'm sorry. We have to create products that are for a, a more indigent population. Mm -hmm. We have to create products that are boutique and connoisseur. We have to create something for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that we're going to see continue for a while because all these new states coming online are very weary of bringing too many people into the fold when they don't even understand it fully. Yeah. So by limiting the licenses, they're limiting the overview that they, the oversight that they need to engage in. Um, but ultimately I do see most states on the Western side, at least on the start, moving towards what we're seeing with craft brew or, mm. or distilleries or something of that nature where, yeah, there's Coors, yeah, there's Bud, and, you know, that is going to be a live well and that is whatever. Mm. They, they can go ahead and have that market. That's sure. fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. That needs to exist. Mm -hmm. But I would rather be Renegade Brewery or a true brewing company where... Yeah, my market share is a hell of a lot smaller, but I also think that I'm, you know, producing a better product and I can command a higher price for that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start to see a lot more of that craft micro specialty connoisseur come back into the market. Sure. And it, it's, it's been kind of pulled away for a while because we see this big money come in and mm -hmm. descend on the industry. And again, they're all they're looking at is a bottom line and how can we build this process that is flawless and, and by the book with every single instance and occasion. That's not life. That's not business. And we need to, again, learn to be malleable. And that's going to get blood back into this industry. So There you go. The um, artisanal approach will exactly. come upon us. But that I think that's the major major piece. I think something that we're going to start to see, hopefully, is what Illinois started. And that's bringing Department of Agriculture in. Mm -hmm. Because for so long, we had Department of Revenue, Department of Health right. engaging in the oversight of production of plants. Yeah. Like, that just doesn't make any sense at all. No. Um, so to be able to uh, be, talk to Department of Ag and to understand their point of view and to understand you know, how, they're, how they treat livestock production and, and traditional crop, crop production, again, taking those practices and bringing them in. Um, there you go. And the, the, tied into that, what these reviewers and these merit-based application processes ultimately want to see is not that, you know, the clinic or Mindful or Denver Leaf or any of these people are tied to you. That's great. Everybody has a successful cannabis operator. How does that set you apart? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. What sets you apart is your ability to engage those traditional industries. So we have our like our list of advisors that we recommend everybody have if you don't have those qualifications into your on your team, whether in ownership or executive management or something of that nature. And they range from that agriculture to research to traditional pharmaceutical or manufacturing backgrounds to security and 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 really showing them that not only do you have these qualifications, but you've actually reached out to people that they didn't think would ever engage in this industry yeah. and brought them on and sold them on it before you had to sell the state mm -hmm. and, and made them buy into your intent and your approach. And that's something that I think every reviewer in every state really wants to see, even though it's not black and white in that application. Yeah. You're starting to see it in these extra credits, which they're starting to give away, which mm -hmm. go over all the things I talked about earlier, substance abuse and environmental stewardship and community integration. I think that's going to become a bigger play in a lot of these. but. Ultimately, I think, you know, we're going to see one, the smaller businesses be allowed to open up again soon. And I think we're going to see this treated hopefully more like liquor licenses going forward, where as long as you get local approval, yeah. open, open Have your business, at it. No, yeah. no plant count caps. We're seeing those go away, which is nice mm -hmm. um, because they're so arbitrary. That's Sidney Franklin's approach in, in Alaska, and I guess the, uh, more the governor's approach, which is let the local territory in Alaska, whatever it is, decide how much of this they want. Mm -hmm. You know, if they want a lot, fantastic. If they don't want any, wonderful. Yep. Done. I totally, I, I mean, I get all the, on the onset of this industry becoming something big. Of course, we're going to be conservative with it. We yeah. need to try to rein it in any way we can. Plant counts or plant canopy limitations were a mm -hmm. great way to do that. Mm -hmm. But as we start to understand how truly benign cannabis is, especially as compared to tobacco or alcohol, things that are regulated far less, mm -hmm. um, we're going to see that ease up a little bit. There you go. Um, you know, working with Steve Fox now on this public consumption thing, uh, which ties in very well to Sexpot, obviously. We've been running underground public consumption shows for three years now here in Denver. Mm -hmm. Legal or not, I think anybody can make that argument. It's a gray area. Talk more about that. Yeah, so uh, Sexy Pizza, uh, we opened our second store uh, three and a half years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, about six months into that, we started doing late night shows after we closed, mm -hmm. um, tied into the, sex pot, uh, the Sexy Pizza marketing mm -hmm. I was talking about 
uh, sponsoring these comedy shows, mm-hmm. we said, let's let's do our own show, except let's make it cannabis friendly. Because right. all these current venues in Denver that were holding these shows wouldn't have allowed it. Mm-hmm. So we put a big curtain up over the front of Sexy Pizza 2 down on South Pearl mm-hmm. and brought in the PA and, and invited people privately on Facebook and had cannabis consumption and pizza shows. We were watching comedy and they were a big hit. And that grew into our monthly shows at the Oriental, which all of a sudden now we have 300 people in this big theater smoking cannabis in a public venue. Mm-hmm. And, you know, knock on wood, we've never had any issues with the authorities because we're doing it in a responsible and respectful manner. Mm-hmm. We're not blasting it out to the public saying that smoke cannabis here, smoke cannabis here, like all these places do that get cease and desist letters mm-hmm. and, and deal with all those issues. Um, we just have our sex bot logo on a poster. And people that are in the know I understand that if you see that there, it's a cannabis friendly show. It's kind of like a speakeasy mm-hmm. uh, for cannabis, but it's evolved into this thing to where, yeah, we have 37 live shows uh, in Denver every month now and shows in Chicago and LA and, and, and New York, we're doing our first show next month and we're starting to do cannabis friendly shows in those spaces. So getting ahead of that conversation. How can you do it in those States? N- not California. How can you do it in New York or Illinois? Again, just like it's in here in Denver, it's not technically a legal thing, but it's also a private party. Yeah. So there, you know, yeah. there, there, there's, it's there's that, those gray areas with uh, black and white definitions that you've put on them, basically. Yeah. And, right. you know, I understand New York's a little bit more of a push and Illinois is a little bit more of a push. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there needs to be that push on a social level if you're going to get that progress. So, totally. um, and to that end, talk about what you're doing with Steve Pot, uh, Steve Pot, Steve Fox and public. He might as well change his last name. Right. <laughs> It'd be easier. Um, <laughs> so uh, Steve Fox, uh, Christian Cedarberg, the Vicente Strategies Group. Um, who I also work with Steve on the Council on Responsible Cannabis Regulation, Mm -hmm. uh, which promotes uh, responsible regulations around the country and world and helps people get educated on uh, what a regulated environment looks like. Um, They are dealing with this issue that really should have been handled in Amendment 64 Mm -hmm. because the intent of it was to equalize cannabis and alcohol, without Mm -hmm. a doubt. Mm -hmm. Um, What does that uh, mean? That means we should have places to consume it publicly. The fact that we had to fight to even be able to use it on the front stoop or the front porch of my house, you know, shows how far we have to come yet in this discussion. Right. Um, But, you know, I've always had the thought that there should be a separate license available uh, for existing venues and bars that if you want to allow vaping inside in this designated area, it's not a public health risk to anybody else, then you should be allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a designated area outside where cigarettes are also allowed to be smoked and you want to combust plant material and allow for that, you should be allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I should be able to go to a bar and find some method or find some way to use cannabis and not feel inclined to drink the entire time I'm there. Where, um, where are you in that conversation with Steve and with this, uh, with the group? They're you know? currently raising money yeah. um, to get the signatures put together to get a ballot, uh, to get initiative on the ballot uh, this fall, okay. um, which I'm pretty sure is going to be a slam dunk. So we are, uh, as a state, going to be voting on uh, public consumption or the allowance of existing venues to get these licenses here this fall. Non-presidential year. Non-presidential year. And you're still confident. You know, that's that's an interesting uh, discussion because cannabis laws have always tried to have been passed when you have the younger vote come out in a presidential election. So, Indeed. yeah, the conversation has changed that much. I and mean, the, the things that we're seeing on the federal level, um, you know, people always liken cannabis to gay marriage as well and the similar paths um, that they've kind of gone down. I know mm-hmm. that to, 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 totally different in a lot of respects, but there's a lot of people coming out of the closet and feeling more comfortable with the conversations around these two things and mm-hmm. they're writing very much in parallel. So yeah, I think it is there. People in Denver have overwhelmingly supported every cannabis thing that we've ever passed here. Right. We had the failed state initiative uh, in Colorado here six years ago now. Right, long time. Um, but we had Amendment 64 passed overwhelmingly, especially in places like Denver. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's there. And even if it doesn't pass, that's fine. And I think Steve Fox will be the first to tell you it's not always about passing. Yeah, something. we don't need to win. That's it's it. about keeping it in the public that's space, exactly keeping right. that conversation going. And that's exactly what he's great at. Yeah, without question. Uh, so there are a number of things that I wanted to talk to you about that we're just not going to be able to get to because uh, we're like over time sure. already. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before the two questions is one of the very few times that you haven't had success, sir. And uh, I can see the sticker right here, City Council. Yeah. I mean, what happened? We were supposed to win. I know. Well, you know, I was going against two incumbents for the two open spots, um, people that were cultivated and trained to be politicians. Interesting word use. By the Democratic Party. Interesting word use, yeah. Yes. (laughs) By the Democratic Party, right? Yeah, they, I mean, they were put in those positions by the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Strong union support. Um, they, they, They did everything by the book. Uh-huh. Right. I came in two months before the election and said, 
eh, I'm going to ruffle feathers. I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to swear when I go to these forums and these debates. I'm going to be brutally honest. I'm going to say all the things everybody wants to say, but is afraid to say for fear of losing respect of uh, some political party or the union base or some other um, person they're trying to get an endorsement out of. I, I went in like I've done everything else in my life, and I was myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to engage in conversations that it started as a cannabis conversation when Ian and I did our false mayoral announcement. Mm -hmm. um, we had seen uh, when we made that announcement on Facebook on my private page that there was an internal memo circulated in the mayor's office that following Monday that acknowledged us running. We're like, wow, if we could make a post on private social media that gets that kind of attention, what could we do if we actually took this seriously? We're out there, yeah. So running for mayor was not an option. Far too much money. It was way too late in the process. It was never going to happen. So city council at large was a possibility to at least make some noise. Yeah. Um, but as I got into that, I started to engage in all these other groups that I care about, harm reduction and, and, and homeless. We had just pa passed a camping ban here in Colorado that essentially, or in Denver, that essentially criminalized homelessness. And, mm. and we're seeing all of these social issues, public housing uh, is deteriorating. Low-income housing is almost non-existent in Denver anymore. Um, there's all these social issues that I wanted to at least talk about. And so I did things in my own way. And yeah. I, I spent a lot less money than a lot of candidates. I um, didn't knock on a single door. Um, I didn't really go to that many forums. I did things my own way. Uh, you know, I ended up gaining a little over 11,000 votes. Will you do it again? Maybe someday. Um, I always said that whether I won or lost that I wasn't going to run again. Okay. Um, but, you know, I could see myself uh, going back to when I was 16. I said I was going to retire when I was 35. I made that kind of pledge to myself. Right. And I don't mean retire, retire, but I mean have the ability to not be working anymore. Uh -huh. And I still plan on having that ability. How old are you now? 31. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. I'll, um, so, but, but I could see after that if I get too bored and I uh, don't want to be a Walmart greeter that I might, <laughs> might make that decision. Fair enough. We'll see. Uh, Two final questions. And again, I, I would love to sit down with you again because there's just so much more to talk about that we didn't even get to. Um, but uh, we asked the same questions to everyone. What has most surprised you in cannabis and what has most surprised you in life? Uh, what has most surprised you in cannabis? Oh, what has most surprised me in cannabis? Um, I think the the endurance of the people that helped build the foundation for this industry. Um, people like Steve Fox and Mason mm -hmm. and Brian Vicente mm -hmm. and um, Christian Cedarberg and some of the activists that can continue to stay grassroots, their ability to stay in the, the public space to be relevant still, mm. uh, I think is, uh, is something I never expected. Mm. I, uh, I've seen 99% of the people I knew in the industry five years ago are probably not involved in it anymore. Mm -hmm. And to, to have that kind of staying power, I think, is a tremendous testament to their drive, their will, and their passion for what they're doing. Um, um, people like Betty Aldworth and Aaron Smith are very much in that group as well. Yeah. Um, Jamie Lewis of Good Chemistry. But um, I think just the ability for some of these grassroots activists to really um, stay relevant is, is, is truly surprising to me. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's a good answer. And uh, what's nice is with the exception of Jamie Lewis, we've had everybody uh, that you mentioned on. So that's good. good. Uh, so we're doing, we're doing something right. What has most surprised you in life? Um... I think the I think probably you know I don't know I I don't think I, I think every day is a surprise um, <laughs> I, I think that the thing that surprises me the most is how inherently good people are like if that most people if they're put around other good people and are put in situations that give them an opportunity to progress and to advance mm -hmm. that they'll generally take that opportunity Hmm. And I, I, you know, it goes back to like drug policy reform. Um, we, we totally minimalize and ruin people's opportunity to have a life for themselves and to progress and to make their generation better than the one before them um, because of some petty offense, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be any drug. I think all drugs should be decriminalized. They're public health issues. They're not criminal ones. Mm -hmm. And to, to, to set barriers in people's lives that... Um, it's a barrier to housing and to keeping their children and to getting a scholarship, to getting a job. To take that away from someone when you're 18 or 19 or 20 or 21 it just destroys them. I like, wonder why we have the snowball effect of deterioration in society in so many places like Baltimore and Detroit and all these places. It, it's it's just south side of Chicago. Like, it's because of these barriers we set up for people for public health reasons, not for anything that's cr truly criminal. Mm -hmm. But I think what I've seen and the reason I got involved in Denver Kids and 
and Colorado Youth Symphony Orchestra, I've seen what providing somebody just a little glimmer of hope can do for their attitude and for their motivation and their desire to actually do something better and fully um, uh, realize their opportunities in this life. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most people realize that. I think most people, just because of what we see on the news and, 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 the, and just how people talk about society and other people these days, that we automatically assume that more than half the people out there are just like, useless you know that mm. they that they don't serve much of a purpose except to be cogs but, right um I, I totally disagree and i've seen such amazing things come out of um, very little resources just by having that opportunity mm. so having people see that there's another side that that there is a different different side of the fence of the coin mm. i think has been most surprising that's that's a uh, big picture stuff right there cave on Thank you so much for your time. We, we do want to do it again when uh, maybe you get through some of these states and uh, have a little bit more going on and uh, nationally and maybe even worldwide, right? Let's hope so. You know, I, I, I only want to continue to be involved in this industry if, if, I, if I feel that I'm doing something good. So let's hope that continues. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we didn't even get to the chicken suit. There's, of course, the story of uh, Kayvon somewhat chasing down uh, now Governor John Hickenlooper in a chicken suit. So uh, that's a story for next time. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, Kayvon's pursuits, everything that he has done, everything that he's doing now, or at least most of it. Kayvon Kalatbari, an early voice.